and other news, subscribe to this newsletter at snoozecast.com. This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters and by Gentlefolk. Tonight, we'll read the opening to Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home, written by Emily Post and published in 1922. Post was an American writer and socialite who became the most famous authority on how to behave graciously in society and business. This book, in particular, became wildly popular. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. What is best society? Society is an ambiguous term. It may mean much or nothing. Every human being, unless dwelling alone in a cave, is a member of society of one sort or another, and therefore it is well to define what is to be understood by the term best society and why its authority is recognized. Best society abroad is always the oldest aristocracy, composed not so much of persons of title, which may be new, as of those families and communities which have, for the longest period of time, known highest cultivation. To the general public, a long purse is synonymous with high position. It is true that best society is comparatively rich. It is true that the hostess of great wealth, who constantly and lavishly entertains, will shine more brilliantly than her less affluent sister. Yet the latter, through her quality of birth, her poise, her inimitable distinction, is often the jewel of deeper water in the social crown of her time. Money brings certain people before the public. Sometimes they are persons of quality. Quite as often the so-called society leaders featured in the public press do not belong to good society at all, in spite of their many published photographs and the energies of their press agents. Or possibly, they do belong to smart society, but if too much advertised, instead of being the queens they seem, they might more accurately be classified as the court jesters of today. The Imitation and the Genuine New York, more than any city in the world, unless it be Paris, loves to be amused, thrilled, and surprised all at the same time, and will accept with outstretched hand anyone 
who can perform this astounding feat. Do not underestimate the ability that can achieve it. A scintillating wit, an arresting originality, a talent for entertaining that amounts to genius, and gold poured literally like rain are the least requirements. As a matter of fact, best society is not at all like a court with an especial queen or king, nor is it confined to any one place or group, but might better be described as an unlimited brotherhood which spreads over the entire surface of the globe, the members of which are invariably people of cultivation and worldly knowledge who have not only perfect manners, but a perfect manner. Manners are made up of trivialities of deportment, which can be easily learned if one does not happen to know them. Manner is personality, the outward manifestation of one's innate character and attitude toward life. A gentleman, for instance, will never be ostentatious or overbearing any more than he will ever be servile, because these attributes never animate the impulses of a well-bred person. A man whose manners suggest the grotesque is invariably a person of imitation rather than of real position. Etiquette must, if it is to be more than trifling use, include ethics as well as manners. Certainly what one is, is of far greater importance than what one appears to be. A knowledge of etiquette is of course essential to one's decent behavior, just as clothing is essential to one's decent appearance, and precisely as one wears the latter without being self-conscious of having on shoes and perhaps gloves, one who has good manners is equally unself-conscious in the observance of etiquette, the precepts of which must be so thoroughly absorbed as to make their observance a matter of instinct rather than of conscious obedience. Thus, best society is not a fellowship of the wealthy, nor does it seek to exclude those who are not of exalted birth, but it is an association of gentlefolk, of which good form in speech, charm of manner, knowledge of the social amenities, and instinctive consideration for the feelings of others are the credentials by which society the world over recognizes its chosen members. Introductions The correct form The word present is preferable on formal occasions to the word introduce. On informal occasions, neither word is expressed, though understood, as will be shown below. The correct formal introduction is, Mrs. Jones, may I present Mr. Smith? Or, Mr. Distinguished, may I present Mr. Young? The younger person is always presented to the older or more distinguished, but a gentleman is always presented to a lady, even though he is an old gentleman of great distinction and the lady a mere slip of a girl. No lady is ever, except to the President of the United States, 
a cardinal, or a reigning sovereign presented to a man. The correct introduction of either a man or woman to the president is, Mr. President, I have the honor to present Mrs. Jones of Chicago. To a cardinal is, Your Eminence, may I present Mrs. Jones. To a king, Much formality of presenting names on lists is gone through beforehand. At the actual presentation, an accepted name is repeated from functionary to equerry, and nothing is said to the king or queen except Mrs. Jones. But a foreign ambassador is presented. Mr. Ambassador, may I present to you Mrs. Jones? Very few people in polite society are introduced by their formal titles. A hostess says, Mrs. Jones, may I present the Duke of Over There? Or, Lord Blank? Never, His Grace, or His Lordship. The Honorable is merely Mr. Lordson, or Mr. Hold Office. A doctor, a judge, a bishop, are addressed and introduced by their titles. The clergy are usually Mr., unless they formally hold the title of doctor, or dean, or canon. A Catholic priest is Father Kelly. A senator is always introduced as senator, whether he is still in office or not. But the president of the United States, once he is out of office, is merely Mr. and not ex-president. The Prevailing Introduction and Inflection In the briefer form of introduction commonly used, Mrs. Worldly, Mrs. Norman. If the two names are said in the same tone of voice, it is not apparent who is introduced to whom, but by accentuating the more important person's name, it can be made as clear as though the words, may I present, had been used. The more important name is said with a slightly rising inflection, the secondary as a mere statement of fact. For instance, suppose you say, are you there? And then, it is raining. Use the same inflection exactly and say, Mrs. Worldly, Mrs. Younger. Are you there? It is raining. Mrs. Worldly, Mrs. Younger. The unmarried lady is presented to the married one unless the latter is very much the younger. As a matter of fact, in introducing two ladies to each other or one gentleman to another, no distinction is made. Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Norman, or Mr. Brown, Mr. Green. The inflection is, I think it's going to rain. Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Norman. A man is also often introduced. Mrs. Worldly, Mr. Norman. But to a very distinguished man, a mother would say, Mr. Edison, my daughter, Mary. To a young man, however, she should say, Mr. Struthers, have you met my daughter? If the daughter is married, she should have added, my daughter, Mrs. Smartlington. The daughter's name is omitted because it is extremely bad taste, except in the South. 
to call her daughter Miss Mary to anyone but a servant, and on the other hand, she should not present a young man to Mary. The young man can easily find out her name afterward. Other Forms of Introduction Other permissible forms of introduction are Mrs. Jones, do you know Mrs. Norman? Or Mrs. Jones, you know Mrs. Robinson, don't you? On no account say, do you not? Best society always says, don't you? Or Mrs. Robinson, have you met Mrs. Jones? Or Mrs. Jones, do you know my mother? Or this is my daughter Ellen, Mrs. Jones. These are all good form, whether gentlemen are introduced to ladies, ladies to ladies, or gentlemen to gentlemen. In introducing a gentleman to a lady, you may ask Mr. Smith if he has met Mrs. Jones, but you must not ask Mrs. Jones if she has met Mr. Smith. Forms of Introductions to Avoid Do not say, Mr. Jones, shake hands with Mr. Smith, or Mrs. Jones, I want to make you acquainted with Mr. Smith. Never say, make you acquainted with, and do not, in introducing one person to another, call one of them my friend. You can say my aunt, or my sister, or my cousin, but to pick out a particular person as my friend is not only bad style, but unless you have only one friend, bad manners, as it implies Mrs. Smith is my friend and you are a stranger. You may very properly say to Mr. Smith, I want you to meet Mrs. Jones, but this is not a form of introduction, nor is it to be said in Mrs. Jones' hearing. Upon leading Mr. Smith up to Mrs. Jones, you say, Mrs. Jones, may I present Mr. Smith? Or, Mrs. Jones, Mr. Smith. Under no circumstances whatsoever say, Mr. Smith meet Mrs. Jones, or Mrs. Jones meet Mr. Smith. Either wording is equally preposterous. Do not repeat, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Jones. To say each name once is quite enough. Most people of good taste very much dislike being asked their names. To say, what is your name, is always abrupt and unflattering. If you want to know with whom you have been talking, you can generally find a third person later and ask, who was the lady with the gray feather in her hat? The next time you see her, you can say, How do you do, Mrs., calling her by name. When to shake hands When gentlemen are introduced to each other, they always shake hands. When a gentleman is introduced to a lady, she sometimes puts out her hand, especially if he is someone she has long heard about from friends in common. But to an entire stranger, she generally merely bows her head slightly and says, How do you do? Strictly speaking, it is always her place to offer her hand or not, as she chooses. But if he puts out his hand, it is rude on her part to ignore it. Nothing could be more ill-bred. 
than to treat curtly any overture made in spontaneous friendliness. No thoroughbred lady would ever refuse to shake any hand that is honorable, not even the hand of a coal heaver, at the risk of her fresh white glove. Those who have been drawn into a conversation do not usually shake hands on parting, but there is no fixed rule. A lady sometimes shakes hands after talking with a casual stranger. At other times, she does not offer her hand on parting from one who has been punctiliously presented to her. She may find the former sympathetic and the latter very much the contrary. Very few rules of etiquette are inelastic and none more so than the acceptance or rejection of the strangers you meet. There is a wide distance between rudeness and reserve. You can be courteously polite and at the same time extremely aloof to a stranger who does not appeal to you. Or you can be welcomingly friendly to another whom you like on sight. Individual temperament has also to be taken into consideration. One person is naturally austere, another genial. The latter shakes hands far more often than the former. As already said, it is unforgivably rude to refuse a proffered hand, but it is rarely necessary to offer your hand if you prefer not to. What to say when introduced Best society has only one phrase in acknowledgement of an introduction. How do you do? It literally accepts no other. When Mr. Bachelor says, Mrs. Worldly, may I present Mr. Struthers? Mrs. Worldly says, How do you do? Struthers bows and says nothing. To sweetly echo Mr. Struthers with a rising inflection on theirs is not good form. Saccharine chirpings should be classed with crooked little fingers. High handshaking and other affectations. All affectations are bad form. Persons of position do not say charmed or pleased to meet you, etc. But often the first remark is the beginning of a conversation. For instance, Young Struthers is presented to Mrs. Worldly. She smiles and perhaps says, I hear that you're going to be in New York all winter. Struthers answers, Yes, I am at the Columbia Law School, etc. Or, since he is much younger than she, he might answer, Yes, Mrs. Worldly, especially if his answer would otherwise be a curt yes or no. Otherwise, he does not continue repeating her name. Taking leave of one you have just met. After an introduction, when you have talked for some time to a stranger whom you have found agreeable, and you then take leave, you say, Goodbye, I am very glad to have met you, or Goodbye, I hope I shall see you again soon, or sometime. The other person answers, Thank you, or perhaps adds, I hope so, too. Usually, thank you is all that is necessary. In taking leave of a group of strangers, it makes no difference 
whether you have been introduced to them or merely included in their conversation, you bow goodbye to any who happen to be looking at you, but you do not attempt to attract the attention of those who are unaware that you are turning away. Introducing one person to a group. This is never done on formal occasions when a great many persons are present. At a small luncheon, for instance, a hostess always introduces her guests to one another. Let us suppose you are the hostess. Your position is not necessarily near, but it is toward the door. Mrs. King is sitting quite close to you. Mrs. Lawrence also near. Mrs. Robinson and Miss Brown are much farther away. Mrs. Jones enters. You go a few steps forward and shake hands with her, then stand aside, as it were, for a second only, to see if Mrs. Jones goes to speak to anyone. If she apparently knows no one, you say, Mrs. King, do you know Mrs. Jones? Mrs. King being close at hand, usually, but not necessarily, rises, shakes hands with Mrs. Jones, and sits down again. If Mrs. King is an elderly lady, and Mrs. Jones is a young one. Mrs. King merely extends her hand and does not rise. Having said Mrs. Jones once, you do not repeat it immediately, but, turning to the other lady sitting near you, you say, Mrs. Lawrence. Then you look across the room and continue, Miss Robinson, Miss Brown, Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Lawrence, if she is young, rises and shakes hands with Mrs. Jones, and the other two bow, but do not rise. At a very big luncheon, you would introduce Mrs. Jones to Mrs. King, and possibly to Mrs. Lawrence, so that Mrs. Jones might have someone to talk to. But, if other guests come in at this moment, Mrs. Jones finds a place for herself and, after a pause, falls naturally into conversation with those she is next to, without giving her name or asking others. A friend's roof is supposed to be an introduction to those it shelters. In best society, this is always recognized if the gathering is intimate, such as at a luncheon, dinner, or house party. But it is not accepted at a ball or reception or any general entertainment. People always talk to their neighbors at table, whether introduced or not. It would be a breach of etiquette not to. But if Mrs. Jones and Mrs. Norman merely spoke to each other for a few moments in the drawing room, it is not necessary that they recognize each other afterwards. New York's Bad Manners New York's bad manners are often condemned, and often very deservedly even though the cause is carelessness rather than intentional indifference. The indifference is no less actual and the rudeness inescapable. It is by no means unheard of that, after sitting at table next to the guest of honor, a New Yorker will meet her the next day with utter on recognition. Not because the New Yorker means to cut the stranger or feels the slightest unwillingness 
to continue the acquaintance. But because few New Yorkers possess enthusiasm enough to make an effort to remember all the new faces they come in contact with, but allow all those who are not especially fixed in their attention to drift easily out of mind and recognition. It is mortifyingly true. No one is so ignorantly indifferent to everything outside his or her own personal concern as the socially fashionable New Yorker unless it is the Londoner. The late Theodore Roosevelt was a brilliantly shining exception. And, of course, and happily, there are other men and women like him in this. But there are also enough of the snail-in-shell variety to give color to the very just resentment that those from other and more gracious cities hold against New Yorkers. Everywhere else in the world, except London, the impulse of self-cultivation, if not the more generous ones of consideration and hospitality, induces people of good breeding to try and make the effort to find out what manner of mind, or experience, or talent a stranger has, and to remember, at least out of courtesy, anyone for whose benefit a friend of theirs gave a dinner or luncheon. To fashionable New York, however, luncheon was at one thirty. At three, there is something else occupying the moment. That is all. Nearly all people of the Atlantic coast dislike general introductions and present people to each other as little as possible. In the West, however, people do not feel comfortable in a room full of strangers Whether or not to introduce people, therefore, becomes not merely a question of propriety, but of consideration for local custom. Never introduce unnecessarily. The question as to when introductions should be made or not made is one of the most elusive points in the entire range of social knowledge. Whenever necessary to bridge an awkward situation is a definition that is exact enough, but not very helpful or clear. The hostess who allows a guest to stand, awkward and unknown, in the middle of her drawing room is no worse than she who pounces on every chance acquaintance and drags unwilling victims into forced recognition of each other everywhere and on all occasions. The fundamental rule never to introduce unnecessarily brings up the question, which are the necessary occasions? First, in order of importance, is the presentation of everyone to guests of honor, whether the guests are distinguished strangers for whom a dinner is given, or a bride and groom, or a debutante being introduced to society. It is the height of rudeness for anyone to go to an entertainment given in honor of someone and fail to meet him, even though one's memory is too feeble to remember him afterward. Introductions at a dinner The host must always see that every gentleman 
either knows or is presented to the lady he is to take in to dinner, and also, if possible, to the one who is to sit at the other side of him. If the latter introduction is overlooked, people sitting next to each other at table nearly always introduce themselves. A gentleman says, How do you do, Mrs. Jones? I am Arthur Robinson. Or, showing her his place card, I have to introduce myself. This is my name. Or the lady says first, I am Mrs. Hunter Jones. And the man answers, How do you do, Mrs. Jones? My name is Titherington Smith. It is not unusual in New York for those placed next to each other to talk without introducing themselves, particularly if each can read the name of the other on the place cards. Other Necessary Introductions Even in New York's most introductionless circles, people always introduce a small group of people who are to sit together anywhere, partners at dinner, the guests at a house party, everyone at a small dinner or luncheon, the four who are at the same bridge table, partners or fellow players in any game, at a dance, when an invitation has been asked for a stranger, the friend who vouched for him should personally present him to the hostess. Mrs. Worldly, this is Mr. Robinson, whom you said I might bring. The hostess shakes hands and smiles and says, I am very glad to see you, Mr. Robinson. A guest in a box at the opera always introduces any gentleman who comes to speak to her, to her hostess, unless the latter is engrossed in conversation with a visitor of her own, or unless other people block the distance between so that an introduction would be forced and awkward. A newly arriving visitor in a lady's drawing room is not introduced to another who is taking leave, nor is an animated conversation between two persons interrupted to introduce a third, nor is anyone ever led around a room and introduced right and left. If two ladies or young girls are walking together and they meet a third who stops to speak to one of them, the other walks slowly on and does not stand awkwardly by and wait for an introduction. If the third is asked by the one she knows to join them, the sauntering friend is overtaken, an introduction always made. The third, however, must not join them unless invited to do so. At a very large dinner, people, excepting the gentlemen and ladies who are to sit next to each other at table, are not collectively introduced. After dinner, men in the smoking room or left at table always talk to their neighbors whether they have been introduced or not, and ladies in the drawing room do the same. But unless they meet soon again, or have found each other so agreeable that they make an effort to continue the acquaintance, they become strangers again, equally whether they were introduced or not. Some writers on etiquette speak of correct introductions that carry 
obligations of future acquaintance, and incorrect introductions that seemingly obligate one to nothing. Degrees of introduction are utterly unknown to best society. It makes not the slightest difference so far as anyone's acceptance or rejection of another is concerned how an introduction is worded or, on occasions, whether an introduction takes place at all. Fashionable people in very large cities take introductions lightly. They are veritable ships that pass in the night. They show their red or green signals, which are merely polite sentences and pleasant manners, and they pass on again. When you are introduced to someone for the second time, and the first occasion was without interest and long ago, there is no reason why you should speak of the former meeting. If someone presents you to Mrs. Smith for the second time on the same occasion, you smile and say, I've already met Mrs. Smith. But you say nothing if you met Mrs. Smith long ago and she showed no interest in you at that time. Most rules are elastic and contract and expand according to circumstances. You do not remind Mrs. Smith of having met her before, but on meeting again anyone who was brought to your own house or one who showed you an especial courtesy, you instinctively say, I am so glad to see you again. Including someone in conversation without an introduction. On occasions, it happens that in talking to one person, you want to include another in your conversation without making an introduction. For instance, suppose you are talking to a seedsman and a friend joins you in your garden. You greet your friend and then include her by saying, Mr. Smith is suggesting that I dig up these cannas and put in delphiniums. Whether your friend gives an opinion as to the change in color of your flower bed or not, she has been made part of your conversation. This same maneuver of evading an introduction is also resorted to when you are not sure that an acquaintance will be agreeable to one or both of those whom an accidental circumstance has brought together. Introductions Unnecessary You must never introduce people to each other in public places unless you are certain beyond a doubt that the introduction will be agreeable to both. You cannot commit a greater social blunder than to introduce to a person of position someone she does not care to know, especially on shipboard, in hotels, or in other very small, rather public communities where people are so closely thrown together that it is correspondingly difficult to avoid undesirable acquaintances who have been given the wedge of an introduction. As said above, introductions in very large cities are unimportant. In New York, 
where people are meeting new faces daily, seldom seeing the same one twice in a year. It requires a tenacious memory to recognize those one hoped to meet most again, and others are blotted out at once. People in good society rarely ask to be introduced to each other. But if there is a good reason for knowing someone, they often introduce themselves. For instance, Mary Smith says, Mrs. Jones, aren't you a friend of my mother's? I am Mrs. Titherington Smith's daughter. Mrs. Jones says, Why, my dear, I am so glad you spoke to me. Your mother and I have known each other since we were children. Or an elder lady asks, Aren't you Mary Smith? I have known your mother since she was your age. Or a young woman says, Aren't you Mrs. Worldly? Mrs. Worldly, looking rather freezingly, politely says yes and waits. And the stranger continues, I think my sister Millicent Manners is a friend of yours. Mrs. Worldly at once unbends. Oh, yes. Indeed, I am devoted to Millicent, and you must be. I'm Alice. Oh, of course, Millicent has often talked of you and of your lovely voice. I want very much to hear you sing sometimes.